Hey, everybody, this is Chris and Kathy from Petability Podcast. We wanted to take a minute to thank you all for tuning in. We appreciate every listener and are grateful for this platform. Please help us share our vision by subscribing to Petability Podcast through your favorite streaming app. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at Petability Podcast and share our content on social media. You can also support the show by making a donation. Simply go to our website at petabilitypodcast.buzzsprout.com and click on the heart symbol at the top of the page. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Petability. I'm your host, Kathy Simons. And I'm your host, Chris Cranston. Our podcast provides interviews and information to help your pets live their best lives. Hey, Kathy, how are you today? I'm doing pretty good today, and I have to say I am really excited to continue this discussion we had from our previous podcast about cats, one of my favorite topics. And today we're going to be talking particularly about environmental enrichment for cats. So it's a super important topic, and we will be joined again by our guest, uh, Tanera Kuznetsov. Yes, much needed topic. So, Tanera, welcome. Thank you for having me back. I love talking about cats, and this next part is definitely something that everyone who has a cat, knows a cat, needs to hear. Needs to know, exactly, important information. So let's get right to it. What is environmental enrichment for people that don't even know what that term entails, especially as it relates to our cats? So environmental enrichment is the stimulation of the brain by its physical and social surroundings. So what are we providing for the brain, for the body, and for the emotional well-being of our animals? So a way for, it's a way for owners or zookeepers uh, to encourage and stimulate natural behaviors in our animals through their sight, smell, taste, touch, and interaction. So when we're dealing with all of the senses, this comes down to basically five categories. So you have your food-based enrichment, you have your sensory enrichment, novel objects or like new things, because we want constant introduction to new things, and then social enrichment and positive training. So now if a cat is active, then it's basically gonna give you overall better health, right? So if you have a sedentary cat, that's when we're talking about these pictures or the memes that you see of the fat cat just laying next to a bowl of food. That cat obviously does not have proper environmental enrichment. A positive environment is gonna give you more confidence. So think about it in your own home. If you're sitting around and your house is incredibly messy, or barren, then you're not feeling fulfilled. You're not going to feel like you can move through your day. And so we want also something that's fun and safe environment for our kitties so that not only are they confident, but they're happy. And when we're dealing with stressful things, so simply moving furniture or dealing with um, a big move and we're packing everything up, that's when we're talking about an unhappy, stressed out cat. An Mm -hmm. unhappy, stressed out cat can actually be a bored cat too. A lot of people don't think about this, but if you're just providing your cat with a litter box, a bowl of water and food, they're bored. And that bored cat is stressed. So they're gonna look to do different things to entertain themselves. And that's when we're talking about a cat that's gonna destroy your furniture or a cat that's going to over groom or some of the other sickness behaviors that I'll touch on. Mm. Let's, um, then let's go right in and let's talk about, you know, more of the, the, the benefits of environmental enrichment for cats. So I like to think of environmental enrichment as your prevention medicine, right? So what can we do to keep our cats happy and healthy? And that is providing them a fun, safe environment. So providing them with things to stimulate their brain. So toys, you know, a different way of feeding. A lot of people think of just throwing some kibble on a bowl and expect their cat to just eat that. But let's be honest, it, it's not very stimulating to an animal that's built to be a predator, a hunter. And so you need to think about things a little differently in how you present them to the cat. And that's gonna all translate into a happier, healthier, more confident being that's gonna have less sickness behaviors. 
because majority of the sickness behaviors that we see in a veterinary clinic actually all come back to stressors. So number one thing that I ask any cat client that comes in with a sick cat, a cat that's been vomiting, diarrhea, peeing outside the box, what happened? What's stressing this cat out? And oftentimes it comes down to what we are, what we are doing or what we're not doing. And that goes back to our environment. Right. So it sounds like, you know, these, these benefits are, are really a way to prevent um, a lot of, of the problems that you're seeing. So, you know, by changing up how they feed, for example. So can you expound a little bit more on ways that we can feed our cat that would be more stimulating and provide them with, with greater health? So when we think about the cat, we have to remember that they are a hunter. Number one and foremost, our cats are hunters. Now, if they were living outside and they were hunters, they would know when the mice were running around or the voles, what time of day would be the best time to go hunting. Um, and they would know their hunting grounds and how to get around. Well, we bring them into our house and they don't have those things anymore, but they still rely on all of those things. So number one being predictability. My cat doesn't tell time. My cat doesn't know that 7 a.m. is when I feed it. My cat actually knows that I feed it because I, I just woke up. So, um, it, for example, in my house, we feed our cats four times a day, um, which is much better than twice a day or even <laughs> once a day feeding. Um, a cat outside would eat eight small meals a day. So they would eat like eight wow. quarters. And that gets often overlooked, you know, like we, I encounter cat owners all the time that just fill up their bowl with dry food and they don't actually know how much they're feeding. They just fill up the bowl. Free well, feed. Exactly. And so, or, or they feed them twice a day, which I mean, twice a day is definitely better than once a day, but if we can, the ideal time, ideally it would be best to feed our cats almost like every five hours. And you're not suggesting cat owners get up in the middle of the night to feed their cat. Right. Not doing it, Tanera. Not doing it. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> I draw a line there. <laughs> I don't blame you. Sleep is precious. And so instead, there's other ways to mimic that. So, for example, in my house, we do four times a day. Um, my husband and I have different schedules. So he wakes up first, and so he feeds them their first meal. So that would be like a tablespoon of dry food. And then I wake up a little bit later and then they look to me after after my shower is when they anticipate their next meal so they wait until after my shower and they know they're going to get you know their wet food and then the same thing at night whoever gets home first feeds the first part of the meal and then whoever gets home second feeds the second part of the meal when i explain it to people this way they start to realize that it's not as complicated as feeding your cat every five hours it's simply giving several small meals Think about automatic feeders. Do you think that that is also a, a way, most people are not going to be home in the middle of the day? Do you think that's a, is that a, an effective way to provide them with that extra or that fourth meal or that third meal? It definitely can be. It's definitely another mm -hmm. way to do it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just not necessarily a fan of doing all of your meals in the auto feeder. So yeah, boring. But, but I mean, if you're going to do that midday meal, absolutely. You know, or if you know that you're going to have a longer day and they've used an auto feeder before, it's a great way to get in that other small meal. The other thing that we know about small meals is that it, you know, regulates our glycemic index better, but it also helps metabolize better. So oftentimes we're dealing with obese cats. So by feeding them more frequently, we're triggering the metabolism. So we're making it so that they're actually burning calories better. And when we talk to how we feed our cats, we really, we want to mimic their natural hunting behavior. So a cat's natural hunting behavior is a hunt, catch, kill, eat. So they go through this entire um, behavior before they actually eat. So how can we mimic that at home? So studies have found that when a cat is hunting, dopamine is released and it creates a feeling like Christmas morning. And I don't know about you, but when I get bacon, it feels like Christmas morning. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Everything's so, better with bacon. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So if we think of it that way, then, you know, they're triggered by the sound and the scent of their prey. 
And so how do we how do we mimic that when we're feeding our cats? And that's not going to be feeding a bowl of dry kibble <clears throat> once a day. So free feeding, in my opinion, just it doesn't work. It goes against all of their instincts. They're not, although they eat several small meals, they're not grazers. Um, and so I deal with a lot of, well, I have multiple cats, so how do I deal with that? And if we think about cats, they're, they, although they can be social beings, they're very much, you know, this is my territory. Is there enough resources? That kind of thing. So if we're only providing three cats, one bowl, we're going to have feeding problems. Absolutely. There's going to be one cat that's going to be overeating, and then we're going to have another cat that doesn't eat at all. So when it comes to our multi-cat households, it's actually best to separate everybody. So may that be different corners of the room or in my house, because I have a cat that will bully everybody out of their food. He gets locked up in a separate room. Um, my old geriatric kitty, she gets her own safe space. And then one other cat gets to just um, eat in the kitchen, you know, kind of have access to everything. But that avoids any bullying behaviors. It gives everybody the time that they need to eat. It prevents them from questioning if somebody's going to be coming behind them to steal their food. It prevents um, the number one thing that we see with cats, which is they will chew and then they turn around and they throw it right back up. Yeah. Um, so basically, you're providing multiple watering holes if you think of it that way. And so it seems hard, but it's really, it's not once you get into the routine. Once it becomes second nature, everybody's expecting it. So like my cats, for example, once we get those bowls ready, they're running to their separate areas. They know where they eat. They know what they're, they're expecting. When we first implemented this at home, it was, there was a learning curve and it was a little, you know, daunting that we're like, oh, we got to do this. Like, how are we going to manage this? But a couple weeks in, you don't even notice anymore. But again, it comes back to how are we going to have healthy, happy cats? And cats that are fighting over food, eating really fast, and barfing are not happy or healthy. Right, right. Mm. So how do we provide more stimulation? Are there different ways to uh, feed our cats versus just prevent presenting their food in a bowl? Absolutely. So my, again, we're talking about predators, right? So we're talking about the hunt, catch, kill, eat. So when we go back to those four things, that's typically not a flat bowl. That is puzzle feeders. They're my favorite. So puzzle feeders are something that's becoming increasingly popular with dog owners and starting to pick up some momentum with cat owners. And there's some really great companies out there that are making these. And once I started using with my obese cat, once I started using a puzzle feeder, he slowed down dramatically. He was no longer scarfing and barfing. He was actually eating smaller amounts and it really helped us with our weight loss. Um, once he figured out his puzzle feeder too rapidly or too quickly, then we switched it out with another one. Now that starts to get kind of expensive. So then you can resort to other fun things. So in most people's houses, we have muffin tins. So if you take a muffin tin and you just put like kibble in each little hole or skip a couple of them, and then they have to paw at it. Um, or if you have a really smart cat, they'll actually just tip the whole thing over. <laughs> <laughs> but then if you're feeding wet food, you can actually pack the wet food again into every other or, you know, just randomly throughout. And you can also do this with your leftover egg cartons. Huh. You can do this with water bottles. If you take a water bottle and you put a hole in the side of it, or even two holes of varying sizes, and then they have to knock it around to get the kibble out. Um, I also, when I'm dealing with obese cats, one of my favorite things to do to also get them to exercise is I will actually take part of the kibble and use it as a game, and I will just throw the kibble. And then he's got to run mm. to the other side of the room to get it. got to hunt it. Right. Oh, or, yeah. or catch it. And you know what else? You know what else, Tanera? That people. Uh, I'm sorry. I'll let you go first, and then I'll tell you what else. I I have another idea. I'm just excited about environmental enrichment. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this really great company that came out and it's called Phoebe and Doc, and they have an entire feeding system. And what it looks like is it comes with four little mice. They look like little mice, and they have these sliding doors. And so you open up the sliding door, and you throw in your kibble, or you can even put in your wet food. And then it comes with like a cloth thing that goes over it. And then you hide those. So 
in a fortunate situation where you only have one cat, you fill that up, you could hide those and that's how you feed for the day. Right. Like you're, you get rid of dishes completely and that's how they're getting their entire meal. It sounds like so much fun too, doesn't it? It sounds like fun. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And they have to hunt it out. Now, if you're dealing with a multi-cat household, you can still do it. Um, you'll just need extra mice or maybe instead of feeding the whole meal like that, you only take like, you know, like a portion of the meal that gets fed into that. Um, I've used the system at home. Two of my cats will definitely do it. One of them, she's like, nah, I'm too old for that. No, thanks. <laughs> I like the, um, the idea, you know, some of the ideas that we use for dogs, right? It can actually be transferred to cats as far as you know getting um making you know food time more exciting and uh, one of the things i like now uh, for my dog and for cats is the snuffle mat it's so easy right the snuffle mat, and cats will use it too it's like foraging through looking for their food we actually have someone who we follow on instagram and I'll, I'll, i can put it in our show notes i think she she make hand makes them uh they're called su superb snuffles and she's used them for dogs and cats. And if I, I, I think maybe even for bunnies too. <laughs> so, Ooh, but um, again, foraging for your food or the foraging box or the foraging bag, right? You put something in the bag, you crumple it up, you put it out, you forage through to get it or the box to get it. It's fun. It is. And that's the other thing is a lot of times it's a matter of finding what's going to work for your cat. Like what right. do they want to hunt? What do they yeah. want to kill? Right. So um i noticed with cayenne i had given him one puzzle toy to start with and it was kind of like a muffin tin it had these little caps on it and he, so he'd knock off one cap and he he'd knock out the food well it was a level one toy and so by the next day he had discovered that if he lifted the bottom of the whole thing <laughs> all the kibble out at once so, done <laughs> Boom. <laughs> so we went back to the scarf and barf situation. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we had to find something that actually encouraged him better. And we found out that a large dog slow feeder bowl, which looks like a maze to him, he was able to paw at and find different ways to get to. And um, if I take that and I even throw in a couple of toys, then he's got to work even harder. Nice. Um, so it all comes back to finding out what, how your cat likes to hunt. Does your cat like to hunt mice or does your cat like to hunt birds and how do we provide for that talking about the puzzle feeders uh that has been one of my frustrations is that a lot of them are too light um whether you're using it with with a canine or a feline uh friend you know to your point tanara so you know if it's meant to be stationary make sure that it is weighty enough that they can't just you know dump it over um, and I also wanted to to just share that uh, I had a cat that was getting um, a special treat for uh, dental. They were dental chews. And uh, at mealtime, before she got her, her portion of food, I would also throw that treat. And that was, she loved that so much. And it's such a simple thing. And sometimes I would throw it on the stairs and then it would ricochet off and, you know, go falling back down the stairs and she had to chase it. It was really exciting. Or, you know, sometimes it would get caught under a bit of furniture and she'd have to reach, you know, with her paw and try to, to you know, get it out from under, you know, a cabinet or something like that. So that's really simple, um, you know, that doesn't take any expense or, or, you know, special uh, work on your part that you can just do to make your cat's life more enriching. And it also strengthens the human animal bond. So that's mm. a great way. Like you're saying, like throwing the treats, this is a way for you to get your kids encouraged with the cat. You know, this is a way for you to get your new spouse involved. Um, you know, another way yet we can strengthen that bond that they need and we need. There, and there must be things that we can do that are really simple, you know, just to even stimulate them uh, visually, right? Is it is it a good idea to open up the curtains and let them bird watch? Oh, yes, absolutely. So I call it birdie TV. Oh, yeah, yeah. bird TV. Yeah. <laughs> I live in an apartment type setting. So I have this wonderful neighbor downstairs who has one cat, so it's just him and his cat. Well, he maintains four bird feeders just for his cat. Oh, and bless his heart. That's yeah. that's our guy. He's our people. <laughs> that's our people. Yeah. 
And so my cats benefit from that as well because of all the birds that come. And we get all sorts of different species and they just sit there and they get so excited, you know, and you'll see, you'll hear like these little trills and all their, all their different vocals will come out, especially at springtime. And we're starting to see a little bit of that now. And so yeah, birdie TV, absolutely. What about, you know, we've talked a lot about feeding and puzzle feeders and homemade feeders and so forth. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about water? Yeah, so it's interesting when it comes to water, some people, cats are desert species. So in general, they don't go water like dogs. They drink very little in short periods of time. Um, but they're very specific. Cats will not drink dirty water. Even an outdoor cat that's lived outside his whole life, when they find water, they oftentimes put their paw in it and stir it up because they don't want any of the algae or, or whatever's on top. They're very smart like that. So cats want fresh water every single day. That bowl's got to be washed and cleaned. They like specific types of bowls. I've run into this in my own house and with clients. Some cats like metal bowls. Some cats like ceramic. I don't recommend plastic because it does um, create a lot of bacteria. And some cats want running water because instinctually running water tends to be fresher, right? So this is where you get those really cool fountains. Mm -hmm. They make all sorts of different types of cat fountains and they have different speeds. Um, if you are trained by your cat, because cats will train us, um, I have a cat who will yell at me until I turn the faucet on. But when I turn the faucet on, it can't be a drip. It can't be running too fast. It's got to be running just, it's be right. just right. He's like Goldilocks. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so, and then again, if you have a multi-cat household, you can't have one watering hole. So you want to make sure you have multiple watering stations for multiple cats. Talking about the running water, I have a friend, Marilyn, who had uh, two cats uh, and they would turn on the water in her bathroom <laughs> themselves. She tried to barricade them out of that bathroom, but inevitably the, they could either bust through the door because it didn't latch well, or a guest would leave the door open and, you know, and she discover hours later, you know, or when she would leave them for a period of time, you know, the water's just like on full blast. So she had to resort to removing the handles on her faucet. Oh my gosh. Oh, <laughs> yep. Yep. Cause they were those paddle type handles wow. and they yep. could, they could turn them on. And so, yeah, she just took them off. She's like, okay, done. And it seemed to be only specific to that bathroom, that sink. So Exactly. But think of all the environmental enrichment they got out of that. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, <laughs> to her chagrin, you know, right? Right. <laughs> you know, in our, in our last episode uh, in, in of this discussion, and if you haven't heard it, you should definitely go back and listen to the first episode. We all agreed about how much we loved uh, Jackson uh, Galaxy, right? We all agreed um, that he's a wonder, the most wonderful cat person in the world, probably. Um, and so one of the things I learned about from him when I'm watching him, not only about environmental enrichment, but how important it is to have playtime with your cat, right? Um, so can you speak a little bit about the playtime, uh, Tanera, and how important that is? So playtime can actually fix a lot of things. So because we're so, we're so ingrained as a society to think that our cats, again, they just need a water dish, a food bowl, and a litter box. And I'll probably say that another 10 times because yeah, yeah. that's just what we think, right? <laughs> but we need so much more than that. And so we need play. They are predators. They are made to hunt. So if they're not hunting, how can we help them stimulate that part of their mind? How can we keep that body moving and agile and make it so they're not bored? You know, the bored <laughs> fat cat. So there's different types of play. So there's interactive play. So that's when that involves you. So that involves the owner. So like Chris, you were saying where you would throw the treats. Mm -hmm. Not only are you feeding, you're playing. Um, and the end goal is amazing because they actually get to eat it. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, one of my favorite types of toys is the fishing pole type. You've probably seen it. It will either be a, a long, oftentimes it's a long plastic wand. 
And then hanging from that can be um, different types of fabric, feathers, or, you know, there can even be a toy hanging from it. And so you play with that, but we have to think like the cat when we're playing with the cat. So cats are hunters, so they like texture, and texture includes motion. So if you're just sitting there with the wand and you're just going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth at the same predictable speed, they're going, going to look at it. They're going to be like, oh, that's cool. Oh, that's boring. boring. Yep. I can catch that in a second. That's boring. So you want something where you go a little bit rapid. You go a little slow. Think like a mouse trying to get across the room. So how, or a bird that's, you know, foraging in the yard and then a dog comes along. So how is that motion? So you want to think about that. Mm. So, you know, going on the ground with it for a little bit and then you flick it up in the air kind of thing. Mm. The other super easy toy is a laser pointer. So I recommend most cat households, if you're sitting on the couch, that you have a laser pointer nearby somewhere. Because you can do this as simply as you're watching your favorite show. It goes on commercial or, you know, you're in between episodes of your streaming on Netflix. You grab that laser pointer, you spend five minutes. And again, you're, you're making it go up the wall, underneath the couch. Um, you're going a little bit slow and then a little bit fast, um, enticing the cat over and over again. Mm -hmm. How long does a, a play session usually last? You know, because sometimes you'll, you know, I'll play with my cat and then I find maybe like, Seven, six, seven minutes in, they caught it, they're done. Is everybody different or is there kind of a, a specific time frame for play? It's often short play sessions. Yeah. Short, frequent play sessions. Hmm. So you're not going to have a cat like you have a dog where you can go out in the yard and spend, you know, 20 minutes no. playing yeah. golf. That's yeah. not going to happen. And so you want... The, the primary goal is to move the toy like the prey, and we're talking about, again, a predator who is an amazing hunter. So by the time they find their prey, decide that they're going to hunt and kill it, it's not going to be long. You're not going to see a cat stalking a mouse for 15 minutes. It's probably going to be about five minutes and over. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned frequent play sessions. Does the time of day have any impact in that? since cats are nocturnal beings, um, are they going to be more likely to engage in play like after dark? Um, you know, I've heard, you know, kind of like sunrise and sunset or particularly active times for cats, or should we really make an effort to, to engage them throughout the day? So I, to your point, definitely, you know, um, dusk and dawn because that's when a lot of the small critters are out. So that's kind of how the brain's wired. Mm -hmm. But I get a lot of people that get upset because their cats are up all night, right? So their cat's up all night, it's keeping me up, it's knocking things over. Play sessions before bed will help your cat settle and sleep better. So I often recommend if you only have enough time to play with your cat one or two times a day before bed. So, you know, like around that seven o'clock period and then again at 10 o'clock, will get them those bursts of energy out so that they'll sleep for a longer period of time at night. Um, but with that being said, you can still play with that cat in the middle of the afternoon if you've noticed that they've woken up from a nap. Um, you can encourage them and get them going. If I'm dealing with a cat that's overweight, I want them to have several, you know, like four or five play sessions throughout the day so that they're burning those calories. Right. But if I'm just playing with my elderly cat at home, I normally encourage at least two of those. You mentioned your elderly cat. I'm also thinking like, um, you know, if an older cat has arthritis or something like that, maybe sticking to more low impact, you know, kind of play, like not encouraging them to jump up high with the laser toy or, you know, throwing an object up high, you know, maybe keep them grounded. As a physical rehabber, I think about these things. <laughs> yeah, of course you do. Me too. No, I totally appreciate that. And that's exactly like, the way that I'll play with the laser pointer with one cat is going to be different than the other. And it's also going to come back to what is their hunting style. And some mm -hmm. cats don't like laser pointers. Some cats don't like fishing pole toys and they're better with more object play. So that would be like your furry mice, the crinkle balls. Um, the top of, if you have the gallon of water, got gallon of milk, that little ring around the top seems to be a big favorite for kitties. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's a true story. I know. <laughs> it's it's like the kids that love to play with the pots and pans and not the expensive toys from the toy store, right? 
Somebody well, should patent the, this. <laughs> we should or the box. It. Yeah. The box. Nothing is better than a box for a cat yeah. or a right? Your right. Amazon boxes. You mentioned bags earlier too, but I just want to, you know, thinking with safety in mind, um, I have seen many a cat stick their head through a handle. Ooh, um, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, even on our paper bags these days, they have, you know, handles. They may not rip off easily, but uh, cut those away. Um, you know, no, uh, you know, like plastic bags that, uh, that they could suffocate in, that kind of thing. Yeah, and even when I'm talking about, like, the top of the milk jug, that kind of thing, that's, again, that's supervised activity. And I would never leave a fishing pole-type toy out for my cat to play with by itself. Because God forbid they were to chew through the string and then they started to ingest the string. Mm, and that needs to be supervised. So we need to be cognizant of what we're giving them when we're not around. Mm. How about, um, do you, I, what do you think about having um, social companionship? Like, do you think a cat would like to, or depending on the cat, maybe like to play with another cat? Cats don't do play dates. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Cats don't do play dates. <laughs> but if you had two cats, let's say. <laughs> so if, if you are already in a multi-cat household or you're introducing a new cat to your current cat, and so you're bringing a new cat into the environment and you've gotten them acclimated and there's a very special way in which you should introduce a new cat and they've gotten acclimated, you will you can find toys that they will play with together. Um, we have a couple like feathery mice type toys that I've noticed that if I throw them out, two of them will go chasing after and you'll kind of see them bat at it back and forth. Um, same thing in the spring and summer when a fly gets in the house. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> so you can, and the laser pointer, a laser pointer in my house will pull everybody out, including, you know, the older, older lady. Mm -hmm. They'll all come out for that. Cool. Yeah. And I think that helps them. I do think that when they play together like that, it brings down the threat level of each other and kind of gets this more like, oh, yeah, we're family. We're good. Okay. It's cool. It's cool. Yeah. What about, I, I've heard Jackson Galaxy talk about, I think it's like the Super Cat Highway. Yes. Um, yeah. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So one of my favorite things in the world is catification, as Jackson Galaxy likes to call it. <laughs> So we recently, this is anecdotally from the clinic. So we had a cat owner call and say that they wanted to get a dog. So how do they go about this? Before you get that dog, you need to catify your house. What's that mean? Cats live in a vertical world. So what that means is the tops of bookshelves, the tops of cabinets, top of the couch. We often see our cats up more than we see them down. So how do we make that even better? Well, we can install shelving throughout our house at different levels that the cat can easily access. And that provides a whole new world for them. So this particular family took our advice seriously. They added several shelves throughout the house that the cats could easily get to so that when their new puppy came home, the cats didn't have to be anywhere near the puppy. And they could observe from a high point, right? From a, van a safe vantage point. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Just like the wild cats up in the trees. Mm -hmm. It's the same kind of thing. They can see everything from up there. They're safe. They're secure. I remember when Tweak first came to live with us, she lived pretty much her first six months on top of our kitchen cabinets because that was safe to her. She could see everything from up there and realize what was and wasn't a threat. Mm -hmm. So we need to think about vertical spaces. People get upset sometimes. Oh, my cat jumps up on the bookshelf and keeps knocking everything over. Well, that's the cat's bookshelf now. So why don't you move yeah, on she, to somewhere else? <laughs> might as well stop taking the books off that and just make it your cat's. <laughs> but I, I mentioned in our last episode about my midge that would jump up onto this cabinet that's very high in the dining room. But after I saw her do this multiple times, to your point, I was like, well, I'm not going to be able to prevent her from getting up there. This is a great place for her that she's very content. So I put a bed up there and I made it nice and cozy and, you know, made, at, to your point, made it her, her place. And that's perfect. And that's exactly the point is that the vertical space that we, we aren't using necessarily, they can utilize. So places like that or... I had a bookshelf that I was moving out of my boy's room and I wasn't sure what I was going to do with it. 
next thing I knew, my elderly kitty was using the second shelf because she can't get as high anymore, but she could get that high. And I was like, mm. you know what? So I moved it to the side of my bed. I put a nice bed there. So now the second shelf is her shelf. There's no books. There's nothing mm. there. That is her shelf. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's just how do we provide these little areas for them? And it's easy. It's, you know, it doesn't have to be expensive. You don't have to go on Chewy and buy all the really, I mean, there are some really cool catification systems. It's in there, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you can simply just put up a wooden shelf, you know, a couple of those at different levels. And that's, again, providing them with more vertical space and it's opening up more areas for them. You can also feed them in these vertical areas. You can put bedding in them. The thing about these areas, though, is um, they do tend to like something that they can put their backs up against. So if you do more like a U shape on your shelves, it's a little bit better because then they can, you know, or even an L shape. So they have one side that their back can go against. It just makes them feel like somebody, something can't get them from behind. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. <laughs> and and how, about pro how about providing them with some something like a hiding cubby space, a hiding space maybe under yeah. something, in something, the, you know, how they love the boxes. Is it important to provide them with a space that's, that they can sort of tuck away and hide in? Cats need to be able to hide and they need safe spaces to hide. Um, so may that be, you know, I leave one of my closet doors open ever so slightly because one of my cats, that's his preferred spot to go hide and nestle. But then you also have cats that like to hide and visualize at the same time. So if you were to do some of these shelving type units and you were to make it more like a birdhouse type situation, it allows them to hide, but to still, sur you know, survey the area. Mm -hmm. um, they make really cool cat tents that cats can curl up inside. But again, when they're hiding in these spaces, they also want them to be quiet. So mm. they want these to be quiet areas for them to hide. So you don't want to go putting a cat tent in your kid's playroom. Like that's not. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, but yeah, it's very important to give them an area to hide and curl up in, in somewhere that's safe. And again, that that way they don't feel like something's going to sneak up on them because as much as they're predators and they're hunters, they are also prey animals. Mm -hmm. And we need to be able to provide for that as well. And preventing but, that's preventing that startle, right? Preventing, yeah. yeah. Those fabric uh, tunnels. Um, my mom has one for her cats, and and those are pretty popular. Mm, they look those like fun. Are a lot of fun. And those you can have a lot of fun with because you can actually throw the treats in them and make them race through them. Um, you can throw the, you know your catnip toy in there and that kind of thing too. So those are really fun. Fun, but th to your point about hiding, I often would uh, find one of the cats in there just sleeping, you know, and tucked in that tunnel. So, and they can peek out. Yeah, exactly from multiple places, from the top, from the ends. So it's it's kind of a twofer. It's it, they can hide and they can play. So let's pivot a bit to the phenomenon of scratching and how we can make that uh, more positive and, and welcoming uh, behavior in our households. So scratching is one of those things that cats have to do. People don't understand that well enough, uh, but cats need to be able to scratch. It is in their DNA. It is part of their behavior. They have scent glands in their feet. So when they're scratching something, they're not just scratching it because they want to, they're scratching it to leave a mark. Um, they also need to scratch because of the actual anatomy of their claws. So cat's claws end up sloughing off the outer layer. And in order to get that outer layer off, they need to scratch something. So then it kind of like pops off. If they don't do that, then it's gonna continue to grow on top of each other and then they get really thickened and then it pushes out. So they're no longer walking on their toes like they're used to and they're now walking on their claws. So that doesn't really work for them. So they need to be able to, to scratch at all times. And so th not only are they doing this for their health, they're also doing this as a form of communication and cats like to scratch differently. So you will have some cats that like to scratch vertically and some that like to do horizontal and some that like different fabrics. So some cats like, you know, cloth, some like carpet, some like wood. Um, so it's a matter of finding what kind of fabric that they actually, material that they actually enjoy. And so when I was talking about catifying your house with these different shelves, they also make cat scratch squares. 
So you can actually hang these squares. So may it be a square of carpet or a square of twine in different areas. So say you have a cat that's trying to scratch at your couch and you don't want them to. Well, you know they like that kind of material. So let's provide them that kind of material in that horizontal or vertical manner um, nearby. So then we can redirect them to that. Um, and so cat furniture is pretty much like all those cat towers and stuff are often made out of materials that cats like to scratch. And then they can leave their scent on it. So that's their area, right? So they can leave their scent and they're doing their scratching. So cat trees are always the best thing. Mm, so many but, great products out there. Really, really great. And you want to make sure, though, that it's sturdy. So yeah. you'll find some cheap cat trees out there that if you just, like, blow on it, it's going to fall over. They fall over. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants that. <laughs> now you've just scared your cat. Yeah, great. <laughs> so I just want to make sure, like, Again, there are a variety of materials. Some devices that can be purchased stand up vertically. Some are horizontal. Finding what works for your cat is imperative. When you find that perfect item, are you to place it near where they were scratching or direct them away from where they were scratching? For example, the arm of the couch. So there's a couple ways you can do this. So there's a product, Feel Away, which is a feline facial pheromone. And you can actually spray that on the area you want them to scratch. Mm. So, um, and they actually make a new product out. I, I forget the name of it, but it's particular. It's again, it's a Feel Away facial pheromone. And you sprinkle it onto the thing that you want them to scratch and it encourages them to go there. But you can also do this simply with catnip. So um, I, you, if you're training your cat, to scratch and they haven't touched your new couch yet, you don't want to give them something that is that fabric because then they're going to look at your couch and be like, Ooh, this is the same, same fabric. fabric. Other thing. <laughs> right. Right. But conversely to that, if you have a cat that's already scratching your couch and they like that particular material, we know yes. that they like that particular material. Then we want to provide them that kind of surface that is in our couch. So you can do that by starting out with the object near the couch that's now a positive area for them to go to, right? Mm -hmm. So I've done this in my house where I will start out with this, the new scratcher right next to the corner of the $2,000 sofa we just bought. <laughs> right. uh. And then I slowly start to move that to a new area. Now, again, cats don't like their environment changing, so you have to do this very slowly. Ah. Um, and sometimes you can't even move it from that area. Otherwise, they go right back to the couch. So sometimes you just got to leave it next to the couch. Mm -hmm. um, but that can be a difficult behavior. The other thing, there are other products out there that can get your cat to stop using it. So um, there is double stick fabric tape. So if they are scratching at your sofa and you don't want them to, they don't like tape on their paws. If you've ever seen a cat with tape on their paws, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> In an evil sort of way. <laughs> it makes for hilarious <laughs> internet videos. <laughs> Um, so the double stick tape on the furniture, I think really helps. I personally used it. It doesn't damage the fabric. Um, and it does make it so they don't want to go back there. And then meanwhile, they don't want to go back there, but right next to them is that nice little new scratching post that I provided them that they do like. So we did not touch on litter box behaviors. And I think oh. the most important in How did we miss that? So litter boxes are one of the top things I talk about in the clinic because it tends to be the number one issue, right? So cat peeing outside the box, automatically the vet gets called. Or they're, you know, or the cat, unfortunately, will get surrendered. Well, there's many ways around this. The reason that they're going inside the box is there's either, A, there's something medical. So I do recommend that you call your veterinarian. Make sure that it's not diabetes or a urinary tract infection or something like that. But then my follow-up question is, where are your boxes and how many do you have and how big is it? So every cat should have two boxes. You have one cat, you have two boxes. You have three cats, you have four boxes. The boxes cannot be next to each other. They need to be in different areas. So that if, you know, cat A is going to the bathroom, cat B goes to go to the bathroom, and they don't want to pee right next to them. They want to, they'll go find an available box. Well, if all the boxes are next to each other. There is no available box. You also want the box to be one and a half times bigger than the cat. So if you've got a big cat, you need a really big box. Then it comes down to what's in the box. 
Cats will dig for at least four to five seconds before they will defecate or urinate. They like to dig a little divot. Well, if they don't like the substrate, so they don't like the type of litter, then they're not gonna dig. They might not even step into it. And you can't just expect a cat to transition to a new litter with no consultation to them. <laughs> right. so you can't suddenly decide that you're gonna start using the newspaper pellets, even though you've been using clumping litter for the last 10 years. They don't know what that is. They're not gonna use it. If you're going to transition to new litter, you wanna do it slowly. So you will add a little bit of the new litter to the old litter style, and then slowly, you know, over time, get over to the whole new litter and they may or may not accept it. Mm. And then the other thing is that some cats like hooded boxes where they feel secure, like you were saying, Kathy, before, like they like to hide. Some like to hide when they go to the bathroom. I don't know about you, but I don't want the door open. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then others don't want to feel secluded like that. They want to be able to see their whole surroundings so that they can know if they need to bolt in any which direction they can. Right. So it's getting to know your kind of cat's own attitude too. So sometimes in a multi-cat household, you might have two hooded boxes and one not hooded. <laughs> in my house, I can tell you because of the multiple boxes, I can tell you who uses which ones more frequently. It lets me know who has diarrhea and who doesn't because I can I can pinpoint to you exactly which cat uses which box to poop because mm. they poop on top of each other, um, which is interesting. So it helps you, again, be able to regulate your cat's health. It helps you to provide them what they need, again, environmental enrichment, and it prevents so many... Um, physical, medical issues. Yeah. And maybe even for you as an owner, it provides you with a little bit of medical information. You know, uh, my cat's not urinating as much, you know, in the box or my cat's having diarrhea in the box or my cat's, you know, leaving hard poops in the box. You know, so that gives us some information when you report that to the veterinarian. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's why you should be cleaning your boxes one to two times a day right. so that you know how frequently your cat is peeing so that if you have a diabetic cat, or a pre-diabetic cat that suddenly seems to be peeing all, but there's like this large amount of urine that keeps coming and keeps coming. You're on top of that. You know, you know, yeah. that's not three day old urine, you know, it's from that day. Yeah. Right. And conversely, so many cats, especially male cats get crystals. And so if they're straining and not producing and it's, you know, a bunch of little, little pee balls, that's an issue too. I, th I think that the, oftentimes the average pet owner, not just cat owner, but pet owner underestimates the importance of urinating and defecating and how much information that provides to their veterinarian. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I see it with dog owners too, that will just let the dog out back and they don't actually follow up with what the dog's done out there. Right. So they don't know if the dog's urinating more or like you said, Chris, like urinating less. I've had a cat that's been blocked before and it's dreadful. And, um, but the only way to really trigger in on that before it's a full bone blockage is to know what's happening in that box. Right. Mm. Cause within 24 hours, that can become a very serious situation and even lethal. Um, and, and to your point with the dogs, uh, I've had so many owners that have had no awareness that there's blood in their urine until there's a fresh snow. And then they happen mm -hmm. to, you know, see it out the window. They're like, what's that? And then they go investigate and realize that their their dog has, you know, urinated outside and it contains blood. So really important stuff. That uh, that brings me to a, an interesting question, I think, uh, debate about cats, about um, to go outside or to not go outside. That is the oh, question. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is the question. I'd love to hear Tanera's thoughts on outside or not outside. Not outside. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. Um, it, we are dealing with a hunter, by all means, and we're bringing them into our homes. But when we let our cats out unsupervised, we are letting them out into so much. There are trains, there are cars and trucks and highways. Cats will cover up to two miles, even a domesticated cat. So your own personal cat could go outside and cover up to two miles. So what's two miles away from your home? In most cases, there's gonna be some sort of highway or major route. 
there's going to be a coyote den. There's going to be foxes and hawks and, you know, so many things are possible. Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing is that your cat could be picked up as a stray. So, you know, Fluffy doesn't come home and there's just a million scenarios of why they don't come home. And the the potential for disease also, also, uh, getting into a fight with another cat, getting an infected abscess, contracting, you know, feline leukemia or anything that can be um, spreadable, you know, via cat to cat, right? Absolutely. And rabies is on the rise. Oh, and rabies, yes, of course, the big one, right? (laughs) Uh, it has there have been cats that have picked up rabies in new england alone Mm -hmm. so you know letting your cat outside you're exposing them to all of these things Mm -hmm. and some of them aren't curable right so or if your cat does come home with a nasty abscess now you have to treat that and then you know now you're dealing with having to stress your cat further by having to give them medication and that's a whole nother thing. Those cat bites are so painful too, you know, to those cats they are so painful. Um, so what I, you know, there are some people that like to do that like to do uh catios, you know, where they have the uh, ability to sort of go outside, but in an enclosure, you know, so yeah. they're outside getting fresh air, but they're safe and secure inside. I believe the word is catio, actually, like a patio. Um, and I'm, I'm not opposed to that, you know, as long as it's secure, as long as it's actually secure. Um, it sounds like it could be fun and environmental enrichment to go into or go outside into a safe enclosure. Absolutely. There, there are ways to do outside. I just think the indoor-outdoor cat yeah. doesn't work. But no, no. I, have, I have leash trained one of my cats, so he will happily wear a harness <coughs> and a leash. Uh, and he'll go outside oftentimes just to lay in the grass um, and chew the grass. But um, so leash training is an option with your cat. It's um, a way to extend their environment because cats that look outside the window, they actually think they own that area. So you might as well invite them into that area safely. Um, catios are really cool. So there are so many different ways to do catios. You can even just do a small one that comes off of a window. Mm-hmm big thing is secure. So we want to make sure that um, whatever type of material that we're using is safe for their paws, Mm -hmm. um, that they can't slip through, get caught up in, and again, supervised. You wouldn't leave something like that open if you're not. Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't. You wouldn't want to do that. It's just not safe. But <laughs> I'd like to expound on that a little bit. Um, I I also, Kathy, had a former dog client who I learned that they created one of those outdoor window areas. And she said it was so great because, again, she lived in, in a fairly urban area. She could open the window. The cat could go out the window, down. And then there was this catio area, you know, down on the ground. So it would just go like in and out. My family friend in Iowa purchased something. So you'd always have to make them. They're they're available for purchase as well. And uh, put it right on her front porch. And she had, I think, up to four cats at one point. Some liked it, some didn't, as we've said all along, right? Each cat is an individual. But there were a couple that loved to go out and spend time on the porch, you know, with them, but all the stimulating sights and sounds and and watching the the birds and the traffic go by and, and all that good stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I think uh, that that they're great as well. I just wanted to say so that. many, so many creative ways to do it too. You know, so and many so, great creative ways. And don't just limit it to the nice weather either. You mm-hmm. know, they oh. they're just as intrigued by snow and by dry dried leaves are like the best toy ever. Um, yes. so it doesn't just have to be in the good weather. You know, you can expose them to other things. Again, don't force it on them. Let them do it on their own. But yeah. Right, right. And, and if you're going to be exposing them to outside, I just like to remind people that you need to be using flea and tick prevention. So if you're exposing your cat to outside at all, especially between the months of April and October, you want to make sure that they have some, you know, frontline or something, a cat safe, cat only product on to prevent, you know, flea infestation because flea anemia is a pretty bad disease in kitties. Oh, yeah. I, I ended up getting a cat through. Kathy and and uh, went over years ago that had flea <gasps> anemia. Hank, Hank, yeah, 
And I he was Hank. I loved Hank. He was a uh, wreck um, when he was brought in. And one of the uh, texts there, uh, it was thought that he needed to be euthanized. But she said, let's just give him 24 hours, give him fluids. Let's see what happens overnight. And I saw this thing and I'm like, oh, my God, he's he's. <laughs> awful he's so ugly and this is gonna be he, no but the miracle is he turned into the best cat ever and he was so handsome but yes in his early times he had the the flea bite anemia so mm -hmm. i i know too that you mentioned i think it was um in the last episode that we had with you and you talked about like again bringing um dried leaves in in the fall and such uh can you expound a little bit on how we can bring the outdoors indoors for our indoor only cats so there's a couple different ways i like to do it seasonally so again in the fall bringing the leaves in um in the winter i will even bring some snow inside the house and let the cats explore it um and then we can also build cat gardens in our houses so you can grow Ooh. catnip that your cat can easily get to um you can there's also different types of cat grasses that you can grow um and these are again these are cat friendly plants that they can readily chew on because cats are known to chew on plants so we do want to make sure that any of the plants in our house are cat friendly right because they can be poisonous i think they the uh i think the uh avma has a list of has a list of non-poisonous plants i think i'll have to look into that but i think there's a list on the avma's website yeah there is actually it it's quite lengthy and i also like to remind people that when you bring flowers so bringing flowers into your house is always kind of fun you know we always like getting a bouquet and i'll even let the cats explore those flowers but i make sure they're safe so if, even if a friend gets me a nice bu bouquet if I look and see that there's lilies, for example, those lilies go right in the trash right away. Right. <laughs> yeah. But those will provide, those will definitely, they cause nephrotoxicity and they'll kill your cat within, you know, 24 hours of consuming one, so. Wow. Um, I, I know we're, we're getting ready to, to wrap it up, Tanera, but I have one thing I'd like you to, to cover on uh, cats for me. And I, a couple of years ago, I went to a, um, a, a lecture, it was given by a veterinarian. I wish I could remember her name, but I can't where she put a video camera in a cat carrier um, to show you what the experience was like for cats oh. to go to the veterinarian, right? And um, it was very, very eye-opening to me. And um, we may not think about your, your, your cat as far as environmental enrichment goes with going to the vet, but it's something that happens to them at least once a year, maybe twice a year. And if they have some medical condition, it could be happening with greater frequency, right? So I think that, you know, one of the things I, I guess if we could just give the cat people a prelude to like, what is it really like to get into that carrier, get in the car and go to the veterinarian? What can we do to minimize those stresses for the cat that has to go to the groomer or has to go to the veterinarian or has to go anywhere? Um, because, uh, you know, that's probably the biggest reason why people don't bring their cats into the veterinarian as much as people bring their dogs in, because it's so incredibly stressful for them to get them in that carrier, catch them and put them in the car. And from the video footage I saw of this woman, um, I can see why it's very stressful. It can be a very stressful event. So I think that cats can read our calendars and they know. Uh, yes, of the course they can. Of course uh, they can. Um, <laughs> because it's always on that day that they hide the best. Right. <laughs> um, so first we tend to not pick up our cats and shove them in carriers on a daily basis. This is something that we're only doing very infrequently. So it's a very foreign space. And when we talk about cats, we talk about that they are very much environmentally driven, meaning that they come back to places, they don't come back to people. And those places include very predictable things. So if they're only seeing that carrier once a year, that can be very traumatic in and of itself. As soon as they see it, they know what's happening, they don't want it. So you wanna keep it out. You wanna keep it um, somewhere where they can see it. So even like the week leading up to the predetermined appointment, and we're talking about non-emergent type situations, you wanna leave it out. I like to use things like facial pheromones, so the feel away. I like to spray my carriers with that. Um, you let it dissipate for about a half hour before you even attempt to put the cat in it. But if you're just leaving it out, so say you're just leaving it out in your living room or out in your mud room, you spray some of that in there, this is, this is good, this is a good place. Otherwise, what we're doing is we're shoving this cat into this small little area, closing a door, 
They can't see anything that's happening. They go into this car, which they don't go in. So now they're in Mm -mm. an environment that's moving. And so all these things are happening. So we want to start at square one. We want to make the carrier familiar. The carrier should also be large enough for the cat. I can't tell you how many times I get these big, big cats and these teeny, tiny carriers. (laughs) They can't even turn around. I know. I know. Poor guys. Needs to be one and a half times the size of a cat. It should be sturdy. So there are some really nice cloth carriers. However, if you go to pick that carrier up and the bottom feels like it's going to like let go because Mm -hmm. it's just soft canvas, like a duffel bag, that's not secure. Um, Carriers that have a front and top access are your best friend. Mm -hmm. It's the best friend for the veterinarian to get the cat out of is the easiest way to get the cat in there. It also gives them more visual access. So they can see that what's above them and they're not worrying about something falling on their head. Mm-hmm. Um, you also want it clean. That's the other thing. I see so many carriers come in that have cobwebs, literally cobwebs on them. Mm-hmm. So yep. you've now just shoved your cat into a box they never ever see that's now dirty. So we want it clean. Um, the other thing is you can provide treats or um, catnip into the carrier. I like to put a soft blanket that smells like home in my carrier. So maybe it's a blanket that they're used to laying on that's not recently cleaned, um, something like that. So it's clean. I mean that it's clean, like it doesn't have anything on it, but it smells like home. So um, something like that in there. Um, And again, these are all bringing our environment with us. Nice. And also spray your car. People don't think about this, but before you leave, while you're getting ready, run down to your car and spray your car with some feel away. Mm. Spray some catnip spray in there. Um, again, this is making them feel like this is a safe environment. And secure your carriers in your car. So secure it with the seatbelt as best as you can um, so that they're not w- weevil wobbling around. Make sure it's a completely level surface so they're not at some weird awkward angle or thrown on top of some you know bulky thing. You want it flat because you don't want to be riding in the bed of a truck kind of being tossed everywhere. Mm -hmm. So let's think of it that way. Um, And then, of course, drive carefully. Try to avoid any abrupt stops, any loud, abrupt noises. So don't go playing music, you know, louder than you would at home. Things that you're listening to at home, you want to kind of, you can provide that in the car again, that it's familiar. And then the other point to that is how are we getting the cats in the carrier? Are we fighting with that cat? Does that cat can suddenly have 10 limbs as you're trying to shove it into a box? <laughs> um, so how are we putting the cat in there? I find one of the best ways to do it, if possible, is to wrap your cat in a towel or something soft like that so that that secures all the limbs and then you can gently place them in. And this is where the top floating carriers come in wicked handy because if you wrap them in that towel and then you gently place them into it, you're not having to shove them through a little door on the front. Is there any more that you'd like to share, Tanera, that uh, we may not have touched on that you think would be important before we close this show? I just want to mention that cats are trainable. People don't think that they are, but they are. So cats can be clicker trained just like dogs. So you can follow the exact same, you know, Karen Pryor clicker training works with cats. Um, You can also teach them all sorts of tricks using their favorite treats. One of my cats does a perfect sit stay which if you can teach your cat a sit stay, especially if the door opens, you know, to, you know, a repairman or you're just trying to get their attention, these, just like you would with any dog, you can teach a cat to do all of those things. So this is, thank you, Tanera. I think we, we covered everything from nose to tail here. Um, and it was all great information. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about all of this. I'm incredibly passionate about making our cats happy and healthy within our homes and whatever we can do to educate somebody, give them little pointers, you know, make life between you and your cat that much better. It just makes me so happy. Thank you. And that's a great, great take home message. So again, thank you to Nara and for our listeners do not uh, forget to tune into the previous episode that we have uh, recorded with Tanera. Um, and we will include a variety of links and websites and resources on both episodes that you can go to to even glean more information down the road. Thank you. Bye. 
Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our show. Follow us on Facebook or on Instagram at Petability Podcast. For more information about Kathy's books and living with blind dogs, please go to enableyourpet.com. Thank you and please tune in next time.